Would you stand with us this morning? Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we start. Father, you are so good to us. We have the freedom to worship you wherever we go. May we engage with you this morning. May we overcome the sinful nature of our flesh. We come here to worship you. You are deserving of our praise. Father, may we worship you. And may you be glorified by that worship. We love you and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Here to lift our voices. Here to engage our spirits with our Lord and Savior. So let's do that this morning. Praise belongs to you. And let every kingdom bow. Let every ocean roar. Let every heart adore you now. Praise belongs to you. And what can I do but sing? The greatest joy I've found is the rain.
assim, aleluia. Christ is our life. May that be the focus as you go to him this morning in prayer. your word, I ask that you would do a great work in our hearts. I ask, Lord, this morning that you would help us to see that we who were once alienated have been brought near to you by the blood of Christ, but also that we have entered into your promises that you have made in the Old Testament as your people. Father, I ask that as we understand this truth, that it would change our hearts, that it would cause us to love you more, that it would help us to see more of you and appreciate what you have done for us in greater measure. Not only that, Lord, I ask that it would help us to be more effective in our evangelism, that it would cause us to go out from this place and seek the lost all around us with this message of reconciliation and redemption. So, Father, we ask you to do this for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. A couple of uh, real quick administrative notes. Uh, first of all, Spencer, can you check and make sure that that computer up there is on ADCC AVB network? Um, as, as, we, as we begin this morning, I want to just take... A real quick minute and let you know that we will not be having our annual vision meeting this evening because of the weather and so we will be rescheduling that for some point in the future and we'll let you know through email and Facebook and all those other crazy forms of communication that that we have um, so this morning we're going to be going to uh, Romans chapter 1 and we're going to be continuing on there and as we do um, the the uh, Screen is not working this morning, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to recite the verse that we're memorizing without any prompts or any helps. And uh, the, the text that we're working on is Romans 1.20. So if you know it or know part of it, say it along with me. For his divine attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Awesome. So this morning we're going to be taking our time to focus on uh, uh, Romans 1, 16 again, and this is the last time we're going to be in Romans 1, 16. We've been in Romans 1, 16 for a while, and the reason we've slowed down so much is because this is Paul's thesis statement in the book of Romans. And as Paul begins this letter, he lets them know that he is not ashamed of the gospel, and that's why he's eager to preach to all those people in Rome. And the reason he's not ashamed of the gospel is because the gospel is the power of God. It is the gospel that is the power of God, and it is the power of God unto salvation. In other words, that God redeems us, he saves us from the condemnation of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. And that was past, present, and future. So our salvation is this comprehensive thing, not just a one-time transfer, but a, uh, a, a long-term uh, progression. In other words, we are saved, 
We have been saved. You know, I should say, we have been saved. We are being saved. And we will ultimately be saved at the final day. And uh, he goes on and he says that this gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So it's by faith that we enter into the promises of God. It is by faith that we are saved. It is faith that the gospel produces and grows. And faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. And that's why we preach the gospel to ourselves. And this morning we're going to be finishing up verse 16 with, with this final statement. It's a parenthetical statement in there, and it's, it's kind of odd if you think about it. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes. Well, you think that that pretty much covers it, right? And he says to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. It's this parenthetical statement. And so my question was, what is he getting at here? Like, wh- why did you add this, Paul? Why is this in there? If you say that everyone who believes is saved by the power of the gospel, then why do you add these two camps? Um, So we're going to be seeking to answer that question today. And the, the main point for this morning is just this. The gospel reconciles all kinds of people, both to God and to each other. The gospel reconciles all kinds of people, both to God, that's our vertical relationship, and to one another, that's our horizontal relationships. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this in three parts. The first one is going to be to the Jew first, and then we're going to look at and to the Gentile also, and we're going to see what including the Gentiles mean. And then we're going to talk about the application for this and implications um, in regards to race in particular. So let's, let's begin um, with the first question. Why does Paul say, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to save it, salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first? Why does he add that in there? And the answer, I think, lies in understanding God's dealings with Israel in the Old Testament. So there is a sense in which Israel, the Jews, have a prominence in God's redemptive plan. And their, promin- or their prominence culminates with Christ coming, and he comes for his covenant people. Okay? So the first, first observation from in, in answering this question of why does it say to the Jew first is this. The spiritual promises given to Israel were always given to faithful Israel. Okay, the spiritual promises given to Israel were always given to faithful Israel. Here's what I mean by that. Remember when the, when the Israelites were in the wilderness? Remember how grumbly they were? How, how they were constantly complaining and constantly bemoaning the fact that they were in the wilderness and we want to go back to Egypt. At least we were eating in Egypt. We didn't have manna every day, right? And then what happens? They go into the promised land and they see God's faithfulness and they see his power and, and they conquer this promised land. And, and, and then what happens? They, like, the book of Judges is maybe the most comprehensive um, book to look at if you want to see the cycle of, of ethnic Israel's or geopolitical Israel's history, right? It goes like this. Uh, everything's going well. They're following God. They're loving God. They're, they're fulfilling their, their commission as God's covenant people. And then there's this statement, and the Israelites forgot the Lord their God, or the Israelites abandoned the Lord their God and chased after these other gods. So they're like, they're, 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 they've got these pagans that they're living with, right? And, and they're, they're supposed to be living with them in such a way that they're proclaiming who God is to them. And they're starting to look around and they're saying, wait a minute, that God that I can see looks kind of appealing to me. I'd rather worship a God that I can see than a God that I can't see. And so there were these Baals and these Ashrafs, and uh, these were the, the pagan religions around Israel. And the Israelites started looking around them and saying, man, they have something tangible. They have something that they can see and touch and feel. We want that. And so they started chasing after these other gods. And so God does this thing where he sort of like removes himself from them because they're chasing all these other gods. And then the the Israelites are like, it doesn't work out for them. So they start coming back to God. Oh, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. We're so sorry. And and God raises up a judge 
Um, and, and he re- redeems the people. He, he uh, frees the people from whatever jam they got themselves into by chasing after these false gods. And the pattern, the cycle just continues, 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 continues. Right? And, and then you get into like the prophets. And you've got these words that aren't like, you don't memorize these for scripture memory verses, right? You've played the harlot. That's how God talks about Israel. You've played, you played the harlot. You went chasing after other gods in such a way that you were committing adultery against me. That's, that's, that's what we see in the Old Testament over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. There's periods of time where Israel as a whole is following God and fulfilling their mandate as his covenant people. And then what happens is they fall off the bandwagon. They go chase other gods. They want something tangible. It happened with the king, right? How did Saul become king of the Israelites? He became a king because the people started looking all around and they're like, well, all these other kingdoms have kings. We don't have a king that we can see. Our king's God. Yeah, that's great and everything, but, but I can't see him. He's, he doesn't have a throne right there that he's sitting on. I can't, I can't like go to him face to face, person to person. I want a king like their king. And so What happens? All right, you want it, have it. And how did that work out for Israel? It's terrible. It's a train wreck. The whole country, the whole nation got split into all sorts of different parts because there were warring factions of offspring within the, the royal family. Right? David's family was a train wreck. That's the history of Israel in a nutshell. Yet, at the same time, God because of his purposes, was preserving a remnant of faithful people. David is among them, right? David's a man after God's own heart. So you got Saul here and David here. What happens with Saul? God removes his spirit from him when he, when he goes to the, to the uh, witch vendor and, and starts, I want, I want, a, I want, a, I want somebody that can, that can really tell me what's going to happen. Like, I want one of these pagan oracles to tell me what's up. So he goes to the witch of Endor. God removes his spirit. Who is Saul? He's an Israelite, yes? Yeah. But he's not part of faithful Israel. David, on the other hand, a man after God's own heart, screws up royally. Like, pun intended. He's just, he, he really messes up. And what happens? He repents, he turns, he's forgiven. And it's through David that the divine king will come. So there's always been two groups within Israel. There's been faithful Israel and then Israel proper, right? And the promises of God, the spiritual promises of God have always been to faithful Israel. If you keep my commands and my statutes, then this. And Christ is the fulfillment of all of God's promises to Israel. So think about this. What happened? They wanted wanted somebody that they could touch, right? They wanted a God that they could touch and worship face to face. What happens? God in the flesh comes down. In in the beginning of 1 John, he who is from the beginning, who we have seen, who we have heard, who we have touched. God makes himself visible and personal to his people. Well, we want a king. We want a real king. Not like this, this ambiguous God is my king type of thing. We want a real king. Well, Christ comes down. He occupies the throne of David. He reigns forever, and he has been seen by his people. But what happens in John chapter 1? He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But to as many as did receive him, who believed on his name, that's what it means to receive him, to believe on his name, he gave them the right to be called children of God. Okay? John chapter 1. He came to his own people. His own people didn't receive him. In other words, his own people didn't believe in him. So he came first for the Jew. And then spread out to the Gentiles. As many as did receive him who believed on his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. What was Israel called in the Old Testament? God's child. Amazing. In other words, from the beginning of Israel, the promises of God were always received by faith. Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, believed 
and it was counted to him as righteousness. So salvation came to the Israelites in the Old Testament the same way it comes to us as Gentiles in the New Testament, by faith. Faith in God's promises, trusting God to be all that he is for you. Christ died, in other words, not only for those who would believe in him, but for those who did believe in him. So the cross, at the center point of history, extends both ways. David, who trusted in God, believed in God, justified by faith, the same way that you and I believe in God, trusting in God, are justified by faith. We sort of have this idea sometimes that like in the Old Testament, you're saved by doing stuff, right? No, that was a picture. The writer of Hebrews makes this abundantly clear. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away your sin. It was a picture of trusting in God's faithfulness in his future Messiah that would come someday that he had promised them. And so you could go and you could offer up a sacrifice, right? You could do it. And I mean, the same way you can come to church and you can sing the, sing the words. And your heart's not in it. You don't have any affection. There's no faith that's, that's causing that. That's why God said, these people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. It has always been by faith. God made special, redemptive promises to faithful Israel, and in Christ, those promises come to reality because those promises were made to faithful Israel, and the Jew, Jew, so therefore the Jews received the gospel first. Second reason, I think, that it's to the Jew first is Israel was to be the means by which God brought salvation to the earth. So the charter of Israel was to tell of Yahweh and make worshipers of Yahweh. They were to care for the barren and the broken and the outsider and the widow and the fatherless. And in doing so, they were to show all the nations around them God. So this is a really interesting text. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 18 to 19. You can write this down and, and go there later because um, I'm going to sort of breeze through this briefly. But Deuteronomy 10, 18 to 19 says, He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow. He loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Here's what God is saying to Israel. This is my character. This is what I'm like. I love the sojourners. I execute justice for the fatherless and the widow, who in that culture were the most, uh, most uh, susceptible people to being taken advantage of. If you're fatherless and you don't have a husband, you have no rights. So the marginalized, the outcast, those are the ones that God executes justice for. He loves the stranger. And he brings them in and gives them food and clothing. Therefore, because I am that way, Israel, you be that way. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to live that out. Or Ezekiel 47, 22, you shall allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the sojourner who resides among you and have had children among you. They, the sojourner, shall be to you as a native born, as native born children of Israel. With you, they shall be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. So not only is Israel now supposed to care for the sojourner that lives there, the outsider that comes and lives among them, but now they get an inheritance. Oh my God, how incredible is that? An outsider comes in to the Israelite community, lives among them, and God says, okay, they're no longer an outsider. Give them an inheritance. They're landowners now. Or Psalm 46, 9, the Lord watches over the sojourner. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. You know, aside, from the, aside from the fact that, that it, it's, it's morally wrong to murder a baby in the womb, 
Aside from the fact that it's an image bearer of God that is being killed by another human being, aside from the fact that they're innocent of any wrongdoing that would deserve any sort of taking of life, aside from all of those things, do you want to know why we're pro-life? The reason that we stand for the unborn, because they represent the most helpless people in our society. And the, and, and the God that we worship loves the helpless and cares for those that are outcast and executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, the people that can't stand up for themselves, God stands up for. That was to be what Israel was to do. They were to stand up for those that couldn't stand up for themselves. Isaiah 61 is sort of God's mission to Israel. It starts off with, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Right? So there's the poor, there's the captives, there's the outcast, and it's, it's ministering to them. So Israel was a kingdom of priests. It was to show God to all the nations of the earth, to submit to God and to extend the reign of God throughout the earth, to care for the outsider and the marginalized. And at the heart of this is redemption. And redemption, let's talk about redemption real quick. Redemption is more than just salvation. Redemption is an Old Testament idea that's rooted in uh, the patriarchs. So a patriarch was the oldest man in his household, and he was responsible for everyone in his household. So somebody enters his household through marriage or through bringing them in, like, like um, Abraham had servants. Those are part of his household. He's now responsible for all of them. And redemption is the idea that the patriarch utilizes all of his resources, everything that he has that he can leverage to go and purchase and care for his family. So, example, Abraham and Lot. Right? Lot's the weird cousin. Lot's the goofy cousin that you don't really like, you know, at family gatherings, that's, kind of, that's, that's just Lot. Um, he's, he lives in Sodom. Don't worry about it. He's just kind of weird that way. Right? Lot didn't even live with Abraham. He was part of Abraham's family, though. And Abraham, therefore, was responsible to him. Well, what ha- for him. So what happened? He's hanging out in Sodom and Gomorrah, gets sacked by a foreign invader. And Lot, and it, the Bible specifies this, Lot and all, of, I think it's in Genesis 14, Lot and all of his family and all of his property are taken by this king. Abraham hears about this. What does he do? Well, Lot, you shouldn't have lived in Sodom. Serves you right. No. He leveraged all of his resources that he had, his army, and went and rescued Lot. That's redemption. That's the idea of redemption. What about Ruth and Boaz, right? Ruth, uh, Naomi, uh, married to an Israelite, right, dies. Her sons die. She's got a uh, daughter-in-law, Ruth, who has no husband, and the two of them are widows together. That means they have nothing. They can't go back to their old property. It's gone, not theirs. So what happens? They go off, and there's a man named Boaz. And Boaz marries this woman and brings her into his family and brings her family into his family. And what does it say that he does? He goes and purchases all of her stuff and redeems it. What about Hosea? Hosea was told by God to go marry a prostitute named Gomer. Gomer was the unfaithful spouse of unfaithful spouses. Like, if you think your marriage is bad, you're not married to Gomer. Gomer went off and left her husband. In fact, the two kids that he had or that she had were both not his. In fact, the names of them were illegitimate and not mine. Those are the names of Gomer and um, Hosea's children, or Gomer's children that Hosea uh, cared for. How would you like that? How would you, how, just think about that. This is, how would you like to that grow up? What's your name? Illegitimate. What's your name? Not mine. Sorry, man. That sounds like a conversation I don't really want to get into right now. Um, so, so what happens? Gomer runs off, ends up at the sail block 
She's sold herself into slavery because she can't afford to pay for stuff. She can't care for herself. What does God tell Hosea to do? Redeem her. Go there and buy that woman. Purchase her back. Take all of your resources and leverage them to bring her back into your family. That's the idea of redemption. It's bringing somebody into your family using all of the resources that you have available. Abraham, remember the three strangers that came? Two were angels and one was God himself. He didn't know who they were. Strangers are dangerous, like stranger danger. It's especially true in a desert society where somebody's going to rob you and plunder all your stuff. What What does Abraham do when he sees them a far way off? He runs to them. That's shameful for a person in that culture to run. You don't run. Men, especially older men, you don't run. By the way, that happens to be my scapegoat for not going out and doing marathons and half marathons. Um, but so, so Abraham runs to these guys. And what does he do? He, he bows down before them. And then what does he do? He washes their feet. And then what does he do? He brings them back and he says to his wife, make up 75 pounds of bread. 75 pounds of bread. It's a picture of bringing them into your family. Now, what does Christ do? Christ shames himself for his people to bring us into his family and the cross. He washes the feet of his disciples. And in Matthew 13, you can go and read it this week, there's a parable where he references 75 pounds of bread. And every biblically literate Jew that was there that heard that parable knew exactly what it was talking about. So Israel, as God's chosen people, were given an extra portion to bring people into the family of God. Finally, the the final reason I think that it says to the Jew first is because Jesus was a Jew. We see that in Romans 1.5. He was a descendant of David. And Jesus' primary ministry was to fulfill, fulfill the promises of the Old Testament and say to the Jews, your promised Messiah is here. We see this in Paul. What did he do when he went to a new place? The first place he went was a synagogue. He took the gospel to the Jew first. But then, let's move on. The gospel is not only for the Jew first, but it's also for the Gentile. It's also for the Greek. So the question now is, what about everybody else? If, if that's Israel, okay, priority for Israel in some ways, is the gospel then just for the Jews? A few things that I'd like to draw out of this part of the text. The biggest division that we see, not only in the earthly church, but throughout the New Testament, is the division of Jew and Gentile. So, early church, you see this huge rift where it's Jew and Gentile. You're a Gentile, I'm a Jew. I'm a, I'm a Gentile, you're a Jew. That's how they saw each other. All throughout the Old Testament, though, the Jews were God's people and the Gentiles were outsiders. Yet, at the same time, God has always been working to save various different kinds of people outside of ethnic Israel. We saw that with Israel's purpose. They were to go and, and live in such a way that they proclaim this one true God to all of the people around them. So take, for example, Melchizedek. Melchizedek was not an ethnic Israelite. He was from an outsider nation, as far as that's concerned. There were no ethnic Israelites at that point. It was, it was Abraham and the promise. And yet there's this guy that, named Melchizedek that shows up, and we don't know much about him. We know he's a king. We, know, we don't know his lineage. And we know that he was from Jerusalem, or what became Jerusalem. That's all we know. But we also know one other thing. He was a worshiper of Yahweh. And he had a priesthood unlike the priesthood of Aaron. And so here's, a, here's somebody that they would consider a Gentile that, that's being saved by God. What about Rahab? Another prostitute. Um, Rahab in Jer- Jericho, in a pagan society, is saved by God's grace and brought into the family of Israel in such a way that she becomes part of the lineage of Christ. She's related to David. 
Same thing is true of Ruth. Ruth wasn't an ethnic Israelite. She was included in the family, though, and became part of the lineage of Christ. So even Jesus' genealogy bears witness to the fact that God has always been saving all kinds of different people outside of ethnic Israel. And in, in the New Testament, we see that this, become, or that, that this becomes not a rare thing, but the norm. So what does Christ say? The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you with power, and you will be my witnesses. Where? Jerusalem, Israelite. Judea, Israelite. Samaria, Muggle. And the uttermost parts of the world. I say Muggle, they're half Israelite, half Gentile. So two of those four were considered outsiders by Israel. Here's what happened. Israel got so consumed with the fact that they were God's chosen people that they didn't remember their mission. They were so consumed with entitlement because of my ethnicity that they forgot that the only reason that they were God's chosen people was by God's grace and God's choice, number one. And number two, so that they might be a light to all the nations around them and bring them in and re- be part of that redemptive thing where they bring them into the family of God. We see in the New Testament the, Samari- the Samarian woman. Beginning of John, Jesus talks to a Samarian. Philip went to Samaria. Peter with Cornelius. We see from the beginning of the New Testament that God is concerned with this gospel, not only staying among the Israelites, but going out. And so it is a gospel for everyone who believes. I was just say something on this real quick. Everyone who believes, no matter... Assurance of salvation can be really tough for some people. A lot of people struggle with that. No matter what your past, no matter what things you've done, no matter what sins you've committed, no matter what blasphemies have come out of your mouth, no matter how bad you've been, and I use bad in quotations, right? Because we're all bad. Um, It's the gospel. You're bad. You can't be good, so Jesus is good for you. And then credits his goodness to you. So no matter how bad you've been, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, if you're receiving him and and, and drinking deeply from the fountain of living water and and eating the bread of life and and, and all of these other things, these other metaphors that Christ uses for belief, if, if you're trusting in Christ alone, then you belong to God. And you belong to his family. That's a, that's a huge issue. It's for everyone who believes. Paul was much worse in his former life than you've been. I can say that with a certain degree of certainty. A pretty good degree of certainty. And yet Paul was redeemed by grace through faith. And so it's for everyone who believes In the old covenant, there was a promise of a new covenant. Now, this is, this, you're going to have to follow me. This is the last part of this, the Gentile also, and then we're going to move to application. But just, just follow me with, on, on this real quick, because this is, this is really important um, in us, especially as Gentiles, understanding how we fit into this whole thing. Um, there's, there's a promise of a new covenant in Jeremiah 31. It's a lengthy passage. I'm just going to read part of it. God says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days, declared the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities. I will remember remember their sin no more. Okay, that's the promise of the new covenant. Now, now we can get hung up on, on one phrase. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. So, we're not of the house of Israel, are we? What about us? Are these new covenant promises for us? Is the new covenant for us? I think by reading two other texts, this will help clarify this. Jesus himself, when he was preaching, taught from this text. He said, 
in John 6, 45 to 47. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So they will all be taught by God was taken from Jeremiah 31. And this is Christ speaking. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Now verse 47 is crucial in understanding this. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel in those days, declared the Lord. And Christ uses the same text as a reference, and his conclusion is whoever believes, receives, or has eternal life. The second text that's important to this is Hebrews 8, 13. In Hebrews 8, he's our, the writer of Hebrews has just uh, quoted this entire text in full. And this is his conclusion in verse 13. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one, the old covenant, obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So, I conclude that as we see these texts, and and I'm going to support this a little bit more in just a second, but as we see this text, there's an old covenant that has been made obsolete and been done away with, and a new covenant that was promised in the old covenant that has come to pass. And that new covenant is for the house of Israel. And my argument is that the church, all of us made up of Jew and Gentile, are the fulfillment of God's promise. In other words, the church is eschatological Israel, the end times Israel, the fulfillment of God's purpose for Israel. We become a part as Gentiles. You and I become a part of faithful Israel. Remember those two categories? There was faithful Israel and then Israel proper. The promises, the spiritual promises were always for faithful Israel. And we become a part of spiritual Israel by virtue of the fact that we have been united with the perfect, true Israelite Jesus Christ. Christ came to fulfill all of God's promises to faithful Israel. He was the true Israelite, the one who succeeded where Israel failed, the one who was faithful when Israel ran away, the one who completed his mission where Israel ran and didn't complete their mission. And when we're united with Christ by faith, we become a part of faithful Israel. In other words, we're redeemed. We're brought into the family of God and we become children and heirs. Therefore, Jeremiah 31 is very much for us as Gentiles because we are part of the house of Israel by virtue of our union with the true Israelite. Let me support this real quick. The first thing, and you can write these down and come back to them later, but Deuteronomy 14 verse 2. Deuteronomy 14, Deuteronomy 14.2, God says this to the Israelites, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Does that ring any bells in your head of 1 Peter chapter 2? For you, the church made up of Jew and Gentile, are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So the same language that's used of Israel is used of the church. Romans 2, 28, 29, Paul says this, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. In other words, your ethnicity doesn't make you a Jew. That's not your Jewishness. Nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So Paul, for Paul, physical descent does not matter when it comes to whether or not you're a true Israelite, to whether or not you're a part of the house of Israel. It doesn't count as any advantage when it comes to the new covenant. 
or Romans 9 verses 6, or verse 6 and then verses 23 and 24. Verse 6 says this, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. The question is, you know, what about, what about my people? What about the Israelites? Has the word of God failed? They're not believing in Jesus. Paul says it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Same thing. Physical descent does not make you a part of Israel. He goes on in verses 23 to 24, starting verse 22, but emphasize the latter part of 22 and 23. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory? Who are those vessels of mercy? Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So in other words, these vessels of wrath were the Israelites that were unfaithful. Unfaithful Israel, those who did not trust in the promises of God, do not have any advantage at the end day when they stand before God in judgment. And yet there are vessels of mercy that, that comprised of both Jew and Gentile. John Piper said this, so the beneficiaries of promise, the true Israel, come into being not by their physical descent or ethnic connections or even by their faith, but by God's call. Now Paul is picking up on verse 24 where he left off in verses 6 to 13. In between, uh, in verses 14 to 23, is an argument for God's justice in acting this way as he does in his freedom. Let's make sure that we can see the connection before verse 24. And what Paul said earlier, he quotes verse 6, For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. In other words, the point is that only some from Israel are part of God's people. Now notice in how in verse 24 repeats and takes a critical step further. Verse 24 in the last part of verse 25, or 23 Vessels of mercy which, had, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but from the Gentiles. Who are the vessels of mercy? They are those whom God has called. There's a connection with God's call in verse 11. And whom has God called? People from the Jews. That's the same point as verse 6. But not all who are descended from Israel are true Israel. In other words, when we talked about loved by God and called to be saints... The fact that you and I are called to be saints unites us with the true Israelite and makes us part of faithful Israel. Or we can look at John 8, 39. Jesus is preaching to the Pharisees, and what do they say? They answered him, Abraham is our father. We're Israelites. What are you talking about, man? And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did. Abraham was not their father. In other words, they are physical offspring of Abraham, but not spiritual offspring of Abraham. They don't believe as Abraham did. Philippians 3.3, we dealt with this when we were going through Philippians. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Jew and Gentile, circumcised of heart. Not an outward thing, but an inward Galatians 6, 15 to 16, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, what is this rule? This, it's the rule of the new birth, the, the circumcised heart. Peace and mercy be unto them. And up, listen to this, and upon the Israel of God. God's Israel is made up of Jew and Gentile who are trusting in Jesus Christ and have been circumcised of the heart. John 10, 16, Christ said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. It's very interesting when you look at Isaiah 56, 8. This is the declaration of the Lord who gathers the dispersed of Israel. I will gather them still others besides those already gathered. In other words, the other sheep are Gentiles that are brought into the fold. And there's one fold and one shepherd. 
In Ephesians chapter 2, he says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from God, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ, so united with Christ by faith, You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made us both one. Jew and Gentile brought together as one and broken down the dividing wall of hostility. In Ephesians 3, 6, we're called fellow heirs with faithful Israel. In Galatians 3, 16, we see that it is Christ that does this. I encourage you to read Galatians 3 this week. That would be a great text to go through to see this so clearly. All those who are faith, of faith are sons of Abraham. So all of the promises of God find their yes and amen in Christ. And we are beneficiaries to all of those promises. The way Paul talks about it in Romans 11 is there's this tree and there's branches that are broken off that's unfaithful Israel. And then there's wild branches that are grafted in that's Gentiles. And there's one tree made up of Jew and Gentile. And so we receive all of the promises of made to Israel by virtue of our union to the true, faithful Israelite, Jesus Christ. We're grafted into faithful Israel. And the result is there are no longer two people of God. There is one people of God. The church is the continuation of Israel through Jesus Christ. There's always been a remnant of eth ethnic Israel that was faithful and now all believers, both Gentile and Jew, are included in faithful Israel because we have been united to the faithful Israelite. So here's the question. What does this mean for us? Three points of application. First one is racism. The second one is divisions. And the third one is evangelism. I'll handle number one first. Tomorrow, providentially, I did not plan this. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And... For some of you that lived through the 60s, you probably understand this better than I do. But yet, at the same time today, there are racial tensions all throughout our country. There are racial divides. And it's not only our country. I'm not only talking about black and white. I'm talking about what we see um, in the Middle East. The, the big thing in, in Iraq, back when I was in the army, was Shia and Sunni. Two different ethnicities, and they just oh, they hate each other. They just war with one another. We see all sorts of tension in what used to be the Soviet Union with regards to race. Bosnia, Serbia, all of these different things that we see all around us where there's racism. And, and here's the deal. Like, we see it even here in York. There is racism here in York. And, and racism, let's just be very straight, racism is sin. If you look at somebody based on the color of their skin and perceive them as less valuable, less worthy, less intelligent, um, whatever it is, that's sin. All human beings are created in the image of God and in his likeness. Therefore, all human beings are deserving of dignity. It, the irony of this boggles my mind. There are believers who will fight for the rights of unborn children, and when it comes to race, they're bigots and racist. They look at somebody and judge them based on the color of their skin. But it's not even just like that type of, of attitude. It's not even like a private thing. They're, they're, they're open about it. Almost proud of it. Racism is an issue of not loving others as ourselves. Racism 
and racial reconciliation is a gospel issue. We could fill this church half and half with white and black. And the black people could sit over here and the white people could sit over here. That's not racial reconciliation. Racial reconciliation is where you love somebody, no matter the color of their skin, no matter their social economic status, it goes beyond race here, no matter their education, whatever, you love somebody based on the fact that they're a brother and sister in Christ within the church and outside of the church based on the fact that they're an image bearer of God and created by him. This text deals with race because in this church, the Jews were more Jew than Christian and the Gentiles were more Gentile than Christian and they butted heads. Are you more white than Christian? Are you more black than Christian? Are you more brown than Christian? Whatever the color of your skin, do you view other people based on the color of their skin or do you view them in this church as brothers and sisters in Christ? When you go out to the community, do you view them as image bearers of God and deserving of dignity and respect and needing the gospel? You see, Israel got all self-centered and self-focused. They wanted to all look the same and be the same and be Israel. And they forgot that their mission was to go out. When we look at the gospel, we see God intervening in human history to seek people that are not his own and make them his own. Both Jew and Gentile. And I think that the reason that Paul emphasizes these two different groups, Jew and Gentile, is because the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Equal footing. All right, church at Rome, you got issues. You've got race issues. In Christ, the dividing wall of hostility is broken down and we now have one massive thing in common and that is the Spirit of God. And that overrides any bigotry, any prejudice, any racism that we might have. So the gospel is the issue here. The gospel is the solution to racism. And I would argue the solution to racial reconciliation. Racial reconciliation is where we're treating each other as brothers and sisters and not like, hey, you can come to our church and hang out, but over there. James deals with that a little bit in a different context. You know, there have been two times that I've gone to uh, black churches. One was in Africa, and one was in Omaha, actually, on a missions trip. And I knew for the first time what it, was, what it felt like to be the only person of my color in a room, or one of the few people, because we went on a missions trip. In Africa, I was the only one. Um, and do you know, what, you know what made that not weird? The fact that all of these brothers and sisters in Christ welcomed me like a brother that they didn't pass a judgment based on the color of my skin, that they didn't have a preconceived notion of me because of the color of my skin, that they brought me into their family. So the first one is racism. The second one is divisions. This one is brief. When there are divisions within the church, those divisions come from focusing on ourselves and not focusing on Christ. When Christ has united all kinds of different people together into one family, there's bound to be disagreement. There's different personalities, there's different opinions, there's different views. But here's the deal. Our division, bickering, backbiting, gossip, whatever whatever the issue might be, is resolved in the gospel because we are fellow heirs with Christ, we're brothers and sisters, and we have been redeemed by the power of the gospel into God's family. Brings me to number three. When you focus on the mission, you're less likely to worry about one another and be bickering with one another. Christ gave a mission to Israel, and they failed. Christ, the true Israelite, came and succeeded on his mission, and his mission carries on through the church made up of Jew and Gentile. Israel of the new covenant. And so therefore, we're to go. 
was Israel supposed to do? They were to go to the outsider, to the outcast, to the marginalized. So here's, here's the challenge, right? Number one, think about how often you hang out with people from your own tribe. Now, by tribe, I mean, like, it can be anything. It can be socioeconomic status. It can be uh, hobbies. It can be work. It can be family status. It can be age, whatever. How often do you and I hang out with only people from our own tribe? That severely inhibits our ability to share the gospel. If you're not marginalized and you only hang out with your own tribe, you're not going to go to the marginalized. What does James say? Pure and undefiled religion is what? Caring for widows and orphans. He got that from Israel. From what Israel was supposed to do. And we carry on God's mission through Jesus Christ by virtue of the fact that we're united with him. So we're to go to the marginalized. We're to go to the outcast. We're to go to the helpless. We're to go to those that can't stand up for themselves. We're to go to the poor and the lowly. And we're to take this message of good news that you can, you can be brought into the family of God. You can be redeemed because God has in the true Israelite put all of his resources into Christ. And Christ went out and purchased us back. And he brings us into his family and treats us as children. So let's be a people that go and find others around us that need to hear the gospel. Challenge number two. This week, be in prayer about somebody that you know that you can share the gospel with. Somebody at work, somebody that you run into in the store, somebody that you're friends with, a neighbor, whatever. Be in prayer about somebody that you can take this good news of reconciliation to. And when God gives you that person, when he puts that person in your mind and you can't get that person out of your mind and you immediately start regretting the fact that you prayed for this. Go to that person and share this good news. Tell them about the God who can redeem them and bring them into his family. Let's pray. Father, you have been so gracious to us that in Christ, we as Gentiles, we as outsiders, have been brought into your family and are counted as your children. And though the gospel was preached first to the Jews, it was also preached to us as Gentiles. And therefore, as we have faith in the true Israelite, we stand on the same footing as faithful Israel. Heirs to the same promises, with the same Messiah, the same Lord, the same King, and where Israel failed, we as the church, empowered by your spirit, succeed because you accomplished your mission. And therefore, we, by the power of your spirit, can accomplish continuing that mission. So, Father, would you help us to be faithful in finishing that mission? Would you help us to seek those who are hurting? Seek those who are not like us. Seek the outsider, the marginalized. And just as we were once outsiders, may we share this gospel of reconciliation so that they might be brought into the family. And Father, this morning as we consider the world around us and we see so much hatred based on color or ethnicity, Father, would, would you help us to be a people that's characterized by love? By this, people will know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. Would you help us to people of love, not hate, people of grace, not bigotry, people that are inclusive and seek out those who are not like us, so that we might have that common bond of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. This is for your glory and for our good. the gospel to each other. We're going to sing to our God as we do it. So let this strengthen you as we think about the message this week about going out and sharing the gospel. is 
built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ the Lord, the cornerstone, we made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storms, He is Lord, Lord of all.
It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. I'm loved by you. It's who I am. 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 And you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of our good Father. How unsearchable are his judgments and how instructable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. May the gospel be spread from this body to our community. To God be the glory. Amen. God bless you this week. Go in peace.